Apparently, Joe Biden is good. So now my videos could be seen by everyone. They are supposed to get monthly visits on an ultra-wide monitor in a dark room. Dino creation, but... Sheesh. 40,000 channels and only 150 of them have anything good on. This has been a topic I've wanted to discuss since the very beginning of my Outlast escapades. The Murkoff accounts, six of the biggest pieces of information Red Barrels has released publicly. Each of these comics discuss a certain event that either happened prior to the Mount Massive incident, during the Mount Massive incident, or after the Templegate incident. In this video, the first comic will be read in its entirety, and afterward I will be discussing every single mystery I'm able to find to uncover the overarching story of the Murkoff agency. When that's done, I will theorize future events that may take place in Outlast history. Prepare yourself to be exposed to the nightmarish activities of the putrid corporation we've, as well as in-game characters, been trying to divulge for the past nine years. However, before we get into all these interesting topics, I would like to mention that this video and the five videos that will come after this one will be in collaboration with the YouTuber Rubik's Cube Comics. In Rubik's first video, he will be giving a quality overview of the Murkoff account part one, a look over of the addendum, and his final review of the overall comic book. Make sure to check out his video after watching this one. I have no doubt in my mind that it's going to be incredible. I would like to also give a major shout out to Vanessa Brandy. Without any further ado, I give you the Murkoff account, Deep Searching Issue 1. Outlast the Murkoff account, Part 1, by JT Petty. The transnational Murkoff Corporation tirelessly pushes the frontier of scientific research and development. Partnering with the greatest minds of tomorrow, Murkoff expands the reach of every branch of scientific inquiry, including gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. In the event of mistake or oversight, the Murkoff Insurance and Mitigation Department comes in to minimize economic fallout. Mitigation officers are damage control. They are not here to save lives or help people. They are here to make sure it doesn't cost the the company any more than it has to. Paul Marion and Pauline Glick are Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Officers. Location, FBI Field Office. Oh my god, is that blood? Look at all that money. Let me see your hands. I need to keep this hand on my face. Put your fucking hands up. Okay. I need you to arrest me. Holy crap, I can still see out of that eye. Mr. Paul Marion, born in Cincinnati, passed the Ohio State Bar Exam in 1981. No current address, you're claiming responsibility for one count of arson, one kidnapping, and 14 murders. At least 14, there might be more. Yet there's no evidence for any of this. Of course not. That's my job. Location, Murkoff Rehabilitation Center. I'm going to need a little help here. Happy to lend a hand. I hope, Miss Glick, you won't mind talking while you eat. The matter is urgent. Call me Pauline, please, and of course we can talk while I eat. Where do you want to start? With the steak, please. No, I meant... I know what you meant. You want to know where to find Paul Marion before he does any more harm. Yes, more importantly, we need to minimize the fallout from what he's already done. Sounds familiar. More meat, please. We don't know how early his sabotage of the Murkoff Corporation began, so start at the beginning. The beginning, that would be 2008. As soon as we were partnering up, they started calling us the Pauls, Paul Marion and Pauline Glick. Hilarious. Do you remember the Hatbox murders? Of course, what's his name? The Egyptian guy killed all those veterans? Omar, an American. His grandparents were Egyptian. He was born in Newark. They had just found the third body, one Martin Belmont, took them a day to piece him back together. Just like the others, the head was gone. He was a veteran of Iraq, just like the first two victims. A patient at the Spindletop Psychotherapy Clinic at Hatton, Texas. Markov bought Spindletop two years earlier as a part of Blair's Research Through Charity initiative. They had a government contract to help our returning veterans cope with PTSD. The chief psychotherapist there wasn't directly under Murkoff management, so we had to give him the speech. The speech? We're not here to save anybody. The company you work for belongs to a company that belongs to a company that belongs to the Murkoff Corporation. Accidents and lawsuits raise Murkoff's insurance premiums and unnecessary expenses make us sad. We are damage control. We'll help as much as we can. But our bottom line is the bottom line. We're legal mitigation. So your card says. The murdered men were all patients of yours. They were. We'll need to see any notes you have on their therapy sessions. That's impossible. Doctor-patient confidentiality, unless of course you can provide a warrant, like those FBI men did. 
We will also need any information you gave to the FBI. We may need to uh, shape your testimony. Now hold on a second. Are these Sumerian? That's right, Mr. Marion. My patients were damaged while working in the Middle East. Does good to include some Arabic culture to show it's not all war. Who are they? The Apollo demigods given to man to establish civilization and guard against its destruction. Like the Nepal hymn, Genesis 4, quote, The song of God came in unto the daughters of men, their children the mighty man of renown. With animal heads, let's get back on track. Some scholars think so. I like to think it helps our soldiers to see Christian and Islamic myths coming from the same place. Your reports describe experimental therapy, reliving and dissecting the event until it stops hurting. That's where it started, but we began to see negative effects in the therapeutic spiral. Psychological wounds would close, then reopen wider as the therapy continued. Our current method is dream therapy, guided by hypnosis. They can re-experience and release the trauma events subconsciously without a burden to their waking mind. That seems dangerously close to leading the witness. How do you know you're not shaping the patient's memory? The mind knows what it needs. The therapy was remarkably effective. Rates of subconscious abuse plummeted, self-harm and suicidal thoughts were all but eliminated. Sounds great, except for those three homicides. We're going to need to see those consultation transcripts. That's impossible. Get a warrant or talk to the FBI. He stonewalled us, so fuck him and fuck the FBI. We go to a more reliable source. Video surveillance? Sure, the whole place is wired. It's usually Strong Fat who monitors the feeds. Strong Fat? I wish those guys wouldn't call me that. Do the therapists know they are being recorded? Of course not, we're watching them too. And you watched every therapy session? Yes ma'am, making sure nobody gets hurt. Can you show me the victims? This is Martin Belmont, the guy who just got, you know, killed. He was in Afghanistan, I think. Fish in the desert and the insects eating its eyes are embers. But the fish is alive and I'm going to put it in the water I'm carrying, but I, I pick it up and it burns me. That's Priscilla Clark, the second victim. Yeah, she was nice. They had killed the children too, but the, the children aren't really children. They've got animal heads and... If we don't watch them, they'll they'll come in the house and kill all the... And this was the first victim, John Bowers. He was really sad. I think he killed a lot of people over there. Because they, they followed us back. They don't want us... They want our children, the crane, with blood on his beak from, from our heads. He dips his beak and we move like puppets. You said you make sure nobody gets hurt? Yeah, it don't happen often, but this guy, Omar something, he's an okay guy. Just got a lot of stuff to work out. I can't tell them those things are coming in, they move in blood, something that sucks light out, it comes through the walls. Can you describe the thing? No. I want you to try, Omar. Grah! Omar, wake up! When you hear me clap, you will wake! Ah! There's me. You're good at violence. Yeah, I always been big, and I was MP when I was in the army. MP like military police? Yep, they taught me some judo. An egg! It's an egg! Birth in the blood! Every last one of you motherfuckers. We'll need copies of all those sessions. Can I get them as audio files? Sure. You've got a much higher tolerance for crazy than I ever will. It's almost dinner time. Let's go see if we can catch some widows eating dinner. $10,000, but it's cash which you can't file as reimbursement, meaning you won't be taxed on it. Lord knows we need the money, but I wouldn't bet a split nickel that a lawn jockey taking the White House don't take half of it. Yes ma'am, our so-called government certainly is in a sorry state, though if they're going to be evil, we can at least thank god they're idiots. Amen to that. The retroactive arbitration agreement was always Glick's bag. She could have sold dog shit perfume if she wanted to. For 10,000 bucks, this woman gives up the chance at a lawsuit worth a couple million at least. The contract was a brilliant piece of legalese, protected Murkoff entirely, without mentioning the company once. The Apkalu are in their heads. We need to go back to Dr. Claymore's. That was the thing about Paul Marion. He walked around with his head in the clouds, but then he'd make these intuitive leaps. Even he couldn't explain it. It was infuriating, but useful. At least until those initiative leaps took him down a dangerous path. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We went back to Spindletop, where of course we found... I don't think Dr. Claymore is going to be much use anymore. This whole place is on video. We've got the killer. I'm gonna stay here. Well, shit. 
no video, the whole system got smashed to hell. Yeah, that makes sense. The killer's motivation was the culmination of all the separate sessions, and there was only two people who heard everything every patient said. Dr. Claymore and... He's not home. Luckily, a well-dressed white woman has a key to every house in the world. Four missing heads, four coolers. Four directors of the compass, Strong Fat was in security. He was setting up their perimeter. I got Priscilla over here, Bowers, Belmont, and a place he's keeping cool for Claymore, meaning he'll be here soon. I'll call a security team. Strong Fat still sleeping with his childhood stuffed animal? Why are the killers always angry toddlers? We might as well start using his real name. Shit's about to go on record. Fine then. Chris Walker. Little pig? Hands on your head! You are- <laughs> Little pig! Huh? Thanks. He's a Murkoff employee. I think he just retired. <laughs> Yep, still means we gotta get him out of here and cover up before the cops get here. You strong enough to put those coolers in the trunk? We put Dr. Claymore's head in the last cooler and put all four of them in Omar Abdul Malik's apartment. Pretty flimsy evidence, wise but his name and skin color did the heavy lifting. Omar Abdul Malik was innocent? Well, location, apartment of Abdul Malik. I don't know about innocent, but he didn't do the hatbox murders. You seem ashamed. I was. I am. So why did you do the work? Was the money that good? No, I mean, the money was great, but the reason I kept doing it. A big part of Murkoff's business in the modern world is pharmaceuticals and gene therapies. My daughter has the same blood disease that killed my wife, extraordinarily rare and uncurable. But Murkoff had an experimental treatment, commercially unavailable, as a Murkoff employee, I had privileged access. So long as I kept my job, they would keep Alice alive. So, Omar Abdul Malik gets charged with four murders, goes to Supermax for life. Chris Walker's not so lucky. Murkoff uses its employees like Indians use a buffalo carcass. Nothing wasted. I'm sure they took good care of him. That was just the thread that unraveled everything. Chris Walker led to Mount Massive, and then from there... Then the real opportunities presented themselves. Marion never found out about the technologies we were using at Spindletop. How much further we had gone at Mount Massive. It was almost sad. Marion still thought he was my partner, not my target. To be continued in Outlast the Murkoff Account Part 2. Before I start discussing hidden means behind each of the pages, I would like to say how much I respect Red Barrels for how much detail they put into Chris Walker's past life. In the main game, Chris is only shown as a dim-witted brute that only has fragments of his original personality. However, if I look at Chris without a biased outlook, he seems like a stereotypical bad guy that only acts to create longevity in the game's plot. I find it quite refreshing to witness such storytelling by a group of developers. It shows a clear passion toward the character and a little bit of personality we never got to see from him in the game. But anyway, enough positive feedback. It's time to discuss the hidden meanings behind the pages. On the second page of the Murkoff account, the writer explains Murkoff and the greatest minds in the scientific field will be explaining inquiries they have gotten, presumably about their scientific research. The source of these inquiries are probably from Murkoff's shareholders, and most likely from the CIA or some branch of the government. The questions that were specifically asked by these anonymous parties are the progress on gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. Before reading this comic, I had no idea what either of these scientific concepts were about. Thankfully, we have access to the internet, so I looked them up, and what I found was pretty interesting. Let's start with the first one, gene therapy. Gene therapy is a medical field which focuses on the genetic modification of cells to reproduce a therapeutic effect or the treatment of disease by repairing or reconstructing defective genetic material. Second is behavioral psychology. Behavioral psychology focuses on understanding and modifying individual thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Third is information technology. Information technology is the use of computers to store or retrieve data and information. The fourth and last one is medicine. Medicine is the science and practice of caring for a patient and managing the diagnosis, prognosis, prevention, treatment, or palliation of their injury or disease. Despite the fact that all of these concepts can be used to do great things, Murkoff is surely using these methods to conduct all sorts of inhumane experimentation. For example, everything that happened at Mount Massive Asylum. Gene modification was most likely used to repair dying cells from the morphogenic engine's body manipulation. Behavioral psychology sounds guaranteed to put people in as much mental anguish as seen fit by the experimenter. 
This obviously needed to happen for the wall rider to manifest. We saw the usage of information technology when we played as Wayland Park, and medicine for treating lasting pain if gene modification was unsuccessful. Everything seems to fall into place, at least where the first game is concerned. Just like every big company, shareholders and third-party backers would want to see results on what they were spending their money on. If anyone was to find out the nefarious deeds of Murkoff's experimentation, a certain squad of highly trained professionals would be called out to silence the loose end. On the same page, we are introduced to the concept of the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department, or MIMD. This is where we're introduced to Paul Marion and Pauline Glick, two MIMD agents. All that I know is that each individual agent is required to partner up with one or more individuals during a Murkoff loose end investigation. You can compare them to the men in black. Anyway, let's continue. Paul Marion hops out of a taxi, completely covered in his own blood and with copious amounts of cash. He demands that he needs to be arrested by the security guards inside of an FBI office. It's unknown where he came from and why he's carrying around all that money. After he's arrested, Paul was either taken to the hospital or inside the FBI office. I would stick my money on him being placed inside the FBI building. An FBI agent begins to announce everything he knows about Paul, which, as you might guess, is minimal. Paul is calm and claims he has killed more than 14 people during his time at Murkoff. The agent has a hard time believing this because there is no evidence linking Paul to any of these murders. Presumably these victims were other investigative journalists that have tried to leak top secret Murkoff experiments. We continue on to see Pauline Glick at the Murkoff Rehabilitation Center. I find this to be extremely perplexing. Why would Pauline be at the MRC? Two men approach Pauline to discuss Paul Marion's current betrayal. Presumably these two men are also MIMD agents. I can infer this because one of the men says, more importantly, we need to minimize the fallout from what he's already done. Why would this man find it his responsibility to minimize economic fallout if he wasn't a mitigation officer? Also, Pauline clearly says, sounds familiar, in response. The agents pursue information about Paul Marion's betrayal. Specifically, they wanted to know everything, starting from the beginning of Paul and Pauline's partnership. Pauline obliges and starts at 2008, the year of the Hatbox murders. After arriving at presumably Martin Belmont's residence, Paul and Pauline found the retired veteran completely mangled and ripped apart. Pauline mentions that there were others that were killed similarly, John Bowers and Priscilla Clark. The only connection between the three soldiers was that they were all patients at Spindletop Psychotherapy Clinic. All three veterans are complete mysteries, with no background whatsoever. After figuring out the connection, Paul and Pauline go to Spindletop to question the head psychotherapist, Dr. Claymore. After explaining to the doctor they were Murkoff mitigation officers, Pauline asks if she can acquire any notes relating to the veterans' therapy sessions. Claymore vehemently disagrees and demands to see a warrant for the surrender of that confidential information. Paul quickly changes the topic, but it's useless. After talking with Claymore, they both go to the security room to get copies of the sessions. Through pages 12 to 24, everything is pretty straightforward. If I went through these pages, I would just be reiterating what the narrator already read. However, one thing I found interesting on page 20 is that it flat out said Chris Walker is a Murkoff employee. How he got the position at the company is completely unknown. It's actually pretty ludicrous to think a PTSD-ridden man was able to receive a job of that kind. It's even more strange that he was able to acquire a security surveillance job at Spindletop, the very place he was treated for his PTSD. The timeline is a little jumbled because the comic makes it seem like Chris was working at Spindletop and Murkoff simultaneously. Anyway, on page 24, Pauline makes it clear that her target was Paul Marion. For what reason, we have no idea. There's no evidence to determine if the partnership was specifically made to keep an eye on Paul or if it eventually metamorphosed into the internal investigation. On the same page, something else is mentioned that is of greater pondering. As Pauline is talking to the two mitigation officers, she brings up that Paul never found out about the technologies being used to Spindletop. The same technologies that were quickly instated at Mount Massive Asylum after the Hatbox murders were solved. Take of that as you will, it's open to extreme interpretation and interpret I will. Now that I've uncovered all of the mysteries, it's time for me to discuss my theories based on the questions that were left open. My first theory is about Paul Marion and how he ended up at the FBI office. I hypothesize that Paul, after escaping from his kidnappers, went to his house to grab money. It's possible that he was carrying other forms of currency besides USD, but judging from the picture, it looks like it was only American cash. After grabbing money from his house, he inevitably runs into Pauline. Some type of conversation starts and eventually a fight commences. That would explain why Paul is completely covered in blood and why Pauline is at a rehabilitation center with a broken arm. After Paul escapes the fight, Pauline begins a hot pursuit. Paul, knowing he couldn't be able to outrun Pauline, decides to hide until he's able to hop in a cab. Then he makes a decision to go to an FBI office so Pauline wouldn't be able to murder him. After Pauline realizes this, she makes her way to the rehabilitation center where she informs the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department. I believe this theory has a pretty high chance of being true. Besides the evidence I gave during my theory, I have one more piece of proof. Pauline has a motive for trying to kill, or at least capture, Paul. According to her testimony on page 24 of the comic, Paul is her de facto target. I believe this piece of information solidifies this hypothesis. My second theory is about why Chris Walker killed the three patients from Spindletop. I believe the reason why Chris kills his fellow veterans is because he wanted to release them from their mental suffering. Judging the dialogue we read from the three patients, they were enveloped in psychological trauma from their time in the military and from the experimentation done by Dr. Claymore. Since Chris was stationed in the surveillance office, he would have been exposed to his comrades being torn apart by their own mental dilapidation. 
The mixture of this and his own treatment from Claymore most likely led him to snap and free the veterans from their pain. He probably would have kept doing this, but since Paul and Pauline started to investigate, that shut down his operation of killing at the clinic. Even if the killing started out of kindness, I don't believe that's how they came to a close. If we visit page 18, we can clearly see Chris Walker entering his house with a bloody head in his sack. Whose head is in that sack is unknown, but I'm fairly confident that it's not a veteran. I believe after killing his first three victims, he began to see everyone experiencing mental trauma, that giving him the excuse to kill whoever he wanted, or whoever he deemed to be in pain. Sadly, there's no hard evidence for this, only conjecture. However, everything seems to fall into place. My third theory is about how Chris Walker ended up working for Murkoff in Spindletop. After Chris's time fighting in Afghanistan, he went to Spindletop to get treatment for his PTSD. I speculate a while after his treatment commenced, he probably asked Dr. Claymore if he could get a security job at Spindletop. Why they hired him, I have no idea. However, it could have been because Claymore wanted to keep a close eye on Chris specifically. Presumably after a few weeks or months working at Spindletop, he was approached by a Murkoff representative. The representative offered a second security job at an unknown Murkoff premises. The reason why this would occur in the first place is because Spindletop was owned by Murkoff. They would have had tabs on Chris and wanted to know if the experiments were having an effect on him. You might say, isn't that why Claymore gave him the security job in the first place? Well, no, there could have been a multitude of reasons why he gave Chris a job. The hypothetical cause is just too broad to pinpoint. Also, as we've seen, Claymore isn't the type of man to divulge patient confidentiality unless absolutely necessary. This could have engaged Murkoff to give Chris a second job to keep a closer eye on him. Chris, after accepting the opportunity, begins to work there. Eventually, the Hatbox murders start, Pauline and Paul being ordered to solve them. After he tries to cover up all the evidence he could, Chris runs off and kills an unknown person. There isn't really any evidence for this, but just like my second theory, everything seems to fall into place perfectly. My fourth theory is about why Paul was Pauline's target. I believe the reason why Murkoff decided to target Paul is because he was the likeliest person to leak classified information if he ever discovered too much. On page 22, Paul explains he didn't work as a mitigation officer for sick kicks and money. It was to protect his daughter from succumbing to her extremely rare blood disease. Because of this specific sentiment, Murkoff must have wanted him secretly tailed by Pauline, so the possibility of him leaking information was absolute zero. A man with morals would be dangerous for Murkoff's employment. That would explain why he wasn't trusted with top secret information like the advanced technologies that were being used at Spindletop and later Mount Massive. This theory doesn't even have conjecture as evidence, it's purely composed of speculation. However, it would make sense if this was the case. My fifth and final theory is about what kind of experiments were happening at Spindletop. Just like past events show, the government and government sanctioned businesses wouldn't hesitate to experiment on soldiers if it were to benefit them in some way. I theorize the experiments done at Spindletop were to advance the Wall Rider project. The mixture of post-traumatic stress disorder and the Apkulu demigod treatments must have been a prerequisite for the morphogenic engine. As we should know from Outlast 1 and 2, the morphogenic engine needs a method of infection to take full effect. In Outlast 1, it was customized video nightmares for each patient, and in Outlast 2, it was mass religious radicalism. It appears that therapeutic sessions done at Spindletop was a coalition of both these experiments. There's just one small problem with this theory. It's never shown nor hinted that the three soldiers at Spindletop were hooked up to the morphogenic engine after the sessions were concluded. I guess it could be because the patients did not hit optimal mechanism requirements. However, we do know of one veteran that was sent in for morphogenic engine testing, and that was Chris Walker. Perhaps Murkoff was waiting for an extreme reaction by one of the patients to make them legible for experimentation, a reaction that Chris certainly portrayed. In my opinion, there is one piece of evidence that solidifies this theory, and that's direct testimony from Pauline Glick. On page 24, she says, Marion never found out about the technologies we were using at Spindletop, how much further we had gone at Mount Massive. That irrefutably implies that the Mount Massive experiments were being partially replicated at Spindletop. There's also the fact that Jeremy Blair bought Spindletop on behalf of Murkoff, the same man that was the overseer at Mount Massive. One down, five to go. Welcome everybody to the second installment of Analyzing the Murkoff Account, six of the biggest labyrinths in Outlast history that no one has ever discussed in extreme detail. In this video, the Murkoff Account Issue 2 will be read in its entirety, and after such I will be deep diving and explaining what certain elements mean. For example, if some type of scientific phrase is brought up, I will define it and explain how it would fit into Project Wall Rider, or any other hypothetical experiments. When that's done, I will be theorizing on different points that either come up short or don't make sense in a narrow point of view. I'm basing this series off of the singular comic book, so if the hypothesis has more credence in one of the higher issues, I will not acknowledge it if it cannot be put together in a formulaic manner. Hopefully, with all of these precursors in place, we can unlock the secrets of issue 2. Before this video starts, I would like to say the series is in collaboration with the YouTuber Rubik's Cube Comics. In Rubik's second video, he will be giving a quality overview of the Murkoff account part 2, a look over the addendum and his final review of the overall comic book. Make sure to check out his video discussing these details after this one. I would also like to give another major shout out to the magnificent Vanessa Brandy. Without any further delay, I give you the Murkoff account, Deep Searching Issue 2. Ah. 
Outlast the Murkoff Account Part 2 by J.T. Petty The transnational Murkoff Corporation tirelessly pushes the frontier of scientific research and development. Partnering with the greatest minds of tomorrow, Murkoff expands the reach of every branch of scientific inquiry, including gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. In the event of mistake or oversight, the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department comes in to minimize economic fallout. Mitigation officers are damage control. They are not here to save lives or help people. They are here to make sure it doesn't cost the company any more than it has to. Paul Marion and Pauline Glick, Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Officers. Location, FBI On-Site Hospital. We need to operate. The infection in the eye is remarkably aggressive. If we don't address it immediately, he could lose his vision and likely some brain function. Sure, sure, I can just hold on. How long will I be unconscious? 24 hours under full sedation, probably another 36 of heavy pain medication. I don't mind losing some brain function if it takes memories with it, but first, I finish my story. Location, Murkoff Rehabilitation Center. Nothing left but gristle and bone. I hope you enjoyed it. We were under the impression you were going to tell us about Waylon Park, how he got to Peacock. Simon Peacock, of course. Can I ask, how high is your security clearance? Pretty high, we are both Alpha Gray. What would you say if I said Eskimo Rubin? Excuse me? Ah, never mind. Simon Peacock is dead. Wayland Park's story gets us back to Mount Massive. From Anonymous to Human Resources USA at MurkoffCorp.lu. Subject OSHA Neglect at Mount Massive. Sent October 4th, 2012. I'm writing to report a security neglect at the Mount Massive Charitable Hospital in Mount Massive, Colorado. Cost cutting and profit have taken precedence over safety in a manner which endangers staff and patients both. It is hard to imagine conditions continuing in such a state without attention from OSHA, as both physical and digital security measures have been stripped from the facilities. Staff has been required to. An anonymous employee at Mount Massive complained to Human Resources about safety conditions at the hospital. Marion and I were sent in to find any potentially litigious dangers, or if they turned out to be false claims. Official Murkoff policy protects any employee filing a complaint. Unofficial policy is extreme prejudice. Squeaky wheels get greased. You don't mean killed, do you? Not often. Shame and ruination usually do the trick. Murkoff HR forwarded us the email that talk about OSHA potential litigation. I know a veiled threat when I see one. Verified threats are my whole MO. Paul started looking through the logs, but whoever posted the complaint had covered their tracks. I got curious about what Murkoff was so intent on hiding. I'm going to have a look around. 122 feet down. Impressive, am I right? Jeremy Blair, Executive Vice President of Global Project Development. And you are Pauline Glick, Insurance Mitigation Department. I don't remember us being introduced. I try to stay well informed. You all have been doing some interesting work here. When we dropped this guy off two months ago, he was... human. Yes, human. Not so precise a term as it used to be. Where's your partner? He doesn't have the clearance to be down here. You're going to want to make sure he understands then how important it is we weed out the employees who aren't, uh, just relax, Billy. True believers. See anything interesting? Normal hospital stuff. Let's hunt. I say we start with IT. Thank you, Waylon. I'll let you know as soon as we are done. Thanks for taking the time, Miss Haas. How soon are you expecting? Jesus Christ, Glick, you never asked. It's okay, I'm six months along. You had a question about our email system? I'm sure you can imagine Murkoff's rigor concerning digital security. Anybody with access to deep web resources would have to be from corporate. The email was sent through an onion router, bounced through several unidexted servers. Who runs corporate for Mount Massive? I'd start with the head of BizDev, Rick Traeger. Hey, I'm happy to help. I'm a team player and I want you guys on Team Rick. You guys want some coffee or some kind of fancy WAP drink? I can say that because I'm Italian on my mother's side. I'm gonna have a coffee. Denise, be a buddy and bring us some coffee. Thanks, Mr. Traeger, but this complaint, IT is saying it would have come from corporate. Corporate, from the Latin corpus, also the root of corpse. Because a corporation is a body, and any weakness is a wound to the body that must be staunched, cauterized if necessary. 
I couldn't agree more. Well, you certainly look like you know how to take care of your body. Let's stay on topic. Of course, let me ask you this. How would anybody in my department make money sending vaguely threatening emails about my department performing poorly? How much have you cut the security budget? My job is minimizing expense. I'm sure you two can relate. And nothing's as expensive as security. I mean, don't get me wrong, I never metadata. I didn't like... But sometimes you gotta make cuts. I create efficiencies that makes us all safer. Security changes with the times. Money will always be money. Interesting. This guy's dirty as hobo shit. Our coffee. Thank you, dear. You're expecting as well? What? I'm not... You think I'm pregnant? I'm sorry, I'm- oh, god damn it. Mr. Traeger, forgive me for being forward, but I've never been to this part of Colorado before, and I'd love somebody to show me around. You were saying, would you have dinner with me tonight? I put up with that smug asshole for three courses and a bottle of wine. And daddy said, buddy, don't go to the medical school. Doctors are on the wrong side of litigation. Of course, he was right. I've sued more. Before he finally invited me back to his place. I turned down cocaine, so he offered me scotch. Is an Islay, 27 years old, a gift from the head of Murkoff Global HR. How many fingers? You mentioned you have a wine cellar? I wouldn't mind something red. Finally, I bought myself a chance to snoop. I find his internet passwords, his coke stash, his dirty magazines, and a pamphlet for an abortion clinic. A Chateau Gibralot, 1952, old Rick delivers every time. Can I ask if you have a girlfriend? I'm afraid not. I'm a team of one, as they say. 20 minutes go by and he never makes a move. I think he was getting off just hearing himself talk. And then I recognize that bitter undertaste. Son of a bitch. You want to finish my drink for me, honey? Rohypnol? Really? I needed a win. Drink it or lose your balls. I don't care. Now sleep. What is it, dad? My partner's calling. Hold on. I need you to pick me up. He roofied me. Holy shit, are you okay? I'm gonna be. I'm great. That asshole's sleeping and don't worry about him. I found this abortion clinic pamphlet, so let's go talk to the pregnant lady. I'll tell you all of it in the car. You are the leak, aren't you? The baby is Traeger's. He said he'd have me fired if I didn't get rid of it. And if I tell anybody at Murkoff what he's doing, I'm breaking my non-disclosure agreement so I get fired. I don't have any savings. I can't afford a baby if I don't have this job. I needed some way he would get fired or transferred. I just... I just... I figured, fire everybody, make it clean, but Marion always was a cream puff. Got a severance package for Michelle in exchange for her silence. Her assistant, Wayland Park, temporarily took her position. We all know how that worked out. She told them everything. Human resources shredded all records, destroyed all her security clearances. She was done at Murkoff, which I'd count as a blessing, and she still had her baby. <laughs> Lying bitches, both of them. You're too late, Rick. They know everything. You can't prove anything. You can't. <laughs> I think it is good to find small moments of pleasure in your work. What about the baby? Yeah, there's the rub. We got her stabilized and took her to a real hospital. Location, Denver Hospital. She's not pregnant. She never was. It was a psychosomatic pregnancy, and she wasn't the only one. One in three women in the Mount Massive facility was experiencing phantom symptoms of pregnancy, a side effect of the experiments in the basement. It is obviously a huge litigation risk. Every woman in the facility would have a grounds for a multi-million dollar suit. We have to shut it down until- Let me interrupt you, Eskimo Reuben. What? Could you excuse us, Marion? We have to discuss something above your clearance. Once Paul was gone, Jeremy Blair showed me the projected profits for Project Wallrider. It was mind-boggling, phenomenal. All female employees were assigned to other facilities. The experiments continued. I was the last woman in the building. There was one last thing I had to see before I left. This is not my fault. Don't put me in. You can't. I'm Murkoff executive. I'm one of you. Please. I'm not a bad guy. It's not my fault. Of course it's not your fault, Rick. You're not evil. You're sick and... We are going to make you better. 
You're very good at your job, thank you. Have a drink with me tonight? No. I don't eat where I hunt. To be continued in Outlast the Murkoff account part 3. Before I start deep searching, I would just like to say I already discussed all the implications of page 2. In all of the comic books, page 2 is the exact same. Anyway, let's get on with the research. On page 3, where the story officially continues, we're still at the FBI on-site hospital. One of the doctors discusses his concern with leaving Paul Marion's eye the way it is. During the beginning of the first comic, one of Paul's eyes popped out of his head when he was told to put his hands in the air by a security guard. We're basically witnessing the aftermath of the hypothesized fight between Paul and Pauline. The doctor elaborates and tells an FBI agent that the infection in that eye is remarkably aggressive. I would honestly like to know what type of infection that Paul acquired during or before his time at the FBI hospital. If we did, I could determine whether or not if the infection was induced or naturally occurring. After the doctor's dialogue, Paul inquires about how much time he will need to be under anesthesia for an operation. I could assume he's worried about Murkoff killing him while he's under sedation. I honestly would be too if the unconsciousness would last 24 hours. Paul promptly is opposed to getting any type of operation after hearing the doctor's sedation synopsis, even at the risk of losing parts of his brain functionality. After the doctor's surgery proposal, Paul says he would like to continue his story about his time at Murkoff. We then bridge to the Murkoff Rehabilitation Center. The agents that are questioning Pauline Glick ask about Wayland Park and how he escaped to Simon Peacock. Before answering the question, Pauline calls for the agent's security clearances. One of the agents exclaims that they are both Alpha Gray. I tried researching what Alpha Gray meant even at a government level, but I wasn't able to find anything that related. So I tried something different. I looked up the psychological effects of the color gray to perhaps draw a conclusion. According to the website EmpowerYourselfWithColorPsychology.com, gray is solid and stable, creating a sense of calm and composure, relief from a chaotic world. Honestly, that last part sort of got me going. Relief from a chaotic world. A perfect summary for what Murkoff tries to implant in their public relations. Just because its definition complements the corporation so well, I guess it would produce logic to make their higher ranking agents Alpha Gray. However, I wouldn't say that this is the highest ranking of them all. I would elaborate, but then this would become a theory. After the agent tells Pauline his rank, she asks the man if he knows what Eskimo Rubin implies. The man seemingly has no idea what this phrase means. This definitely indicates that Pauline is an extremely high ranking agent at Murkoff. Her exact security clearance is unknown, but it must be on par with Murkoff executives. Pauline snickers and tells the agents Simon Peacock is dead. Pages 5 through 7 are pretty self explanatory. On page 5, Paul tells the FBI agent that there was a leak at Murkoff at one point. The leak is revealed later in the story. On page 6, we flash back, and page 7, we go to the underground lab. Nothing too interesting. However, on page 8, when Pauline is talking with Jeremy Blair, Jeremy makes it clear that it's important to weed out any employees that don't wholeheartedly follow the corporation. He basically doesn't want any mid-ranking employees becoming potential divulgents. This coincides with my fourth theory on my first video about why Paul was being investigated by Pauline. I guess we can chalk this up to being another piece of evidence for that theory. I don't want to say it confirms it because there are still more variables, but it definitely paints a much more clear picture. After the conversation with Jeremy, Pauline meets up with Paul and goes to IT. I'm not quite sure what IT stands for, but it could mean internal technologies. After arriving at IT, Paul and Pauline talk to Michelle Haas and a guy named Waylon. Michelle begins to talk to the two agents and brings up Murkoff's deep web resources. There's no way for me to guess what these resources are without coming up with theories, but with Haas' testimony I can add this to the evidence pile. This is just more proof connecting Murkoff with the government. Remember, the deep web was created by the government for communication and storing resources. After Michelle speaks what's on her mind, Paul jumps in and says the leak used the onion router to send the email. I have a theory that implements this, but I need to save it for later. Pages 9 through 16 are pretty explanatory. Paul and Pauline figure out that Michelle was the leak. On page 17, Pauline confirms the guy named Waylon is in fact Waylon Park, the future whistleblower. On page 21, it's revealed Michelle suffered from a psychosomatic pregnancy. Pauline continues to say one in every three women would suffer from the condition if they worked at the Mount Massive facility. In my opinion, this is another piece of evidence that proves my Atlas II iceberg theory, that different women are affected at different times when it comes to psychosomatic pregnancies. Paul and Pauline are now talking with Jeremy Blair about the litigation risk of having spontaneous conceiving women working at the Murkoff facility. Before Jeremy continues, he says, Eskimo Rubin. After Paul leaves the conversation for not having a high enough security clearance, Jeremy starts to talk about Project Wallrider. This leads me to conclude that Eskimo Rubin is a phrase that means, I need to talk about Project Wallrider. Is your security clearance high enough? That makes the most logical sense for this verbal code. Pages 22 through 24 are self-explanatory. Now that I'm done with the deep diving section, it's time for discussing my theories based on the loose ends. My first theory is about Paul's eye infection. How did he get it? Before I begin, I'm going to be tying this theory into my how Paul ended up at that FBI office theory from my other video. So if you haven't seen my first telecasting, you might get a little confused. Anyway, I hypothesized that Paul's eye infection was caused by the altercation he was in before reaching the FBI office. 
During the fight, Pauline could have thrown or injected some type of substance in or around Paul's head to partially stop brain functionality. The reason why this would have occurred was to keep Murkoff's secrets clandestine. Obviously, this theory is completely composed of conjecture, but it would explain why the doctor says the infection in that eye is remarkably aggressive. In other words, the contagion is abnormal in its ferocity and speed. If this was a normal infection, I don't think it would have been as quick or as troublesome unless it was man-made. It also seems too convenient that the infection would wipe out brain functionality, no matter how small. It just screams Murkoff's best interest. My second theory is about Murkoff's ranking system. Are there two different security clearances for Murkoff agents? As I mentioned earlier for both, Alpha Gray could relate to the color science of gray. And for Eskimo Rubin, it could be a way for higher-ups to discover if they're able to talk about classified information with certain employees. Alpha Gray and Eskimo Rubin, both mysterious but theory capable. With these two concepts, I sense a company correlation, and that makes me hypothesize the possibility of two ways Murkoff categorizes his agents. Let's think of this like a physical iceberg. If an agent has Alpha Gray clearance, then that employee would be sent on missions to investigate sleuths as well as potential corporate spies. In short, they would basically be the fists of the Murkoff Corporation, fighting against individuals that could cause the company to lose serious revenue and to prevent intellectual property from being stolen. Once an agent has shown pure, unadulterated loyalty, they could have the opportunity to start climbing the underbelly ranking system. This is where I believe the term Eskimo Rubin would come in. Now that the agent is a part of the 1%, they will be given tasks to kidnap or kill any type of person that has concrete proof of Murkoff's top secret agenda. These individuals are the hidden weapons of the corporation, working as deadly assassins that are encouraged to forsake their humanity to make an extra dollar, Eskimo Rubin distinguishing these hungry desperados. My third theory is about the type of work Waylon was doing before becoming a software consultant. To be completely blunt, I believe Murkoff hired Wayland to be the assistant of Michelle Haas. His job might have been to catalog files or to help out Michelle with software-related technicalities. Nothing too exciting, considering we already knew Wayland was confirmed to be an assistant. However, since we never found out what he specifically did, I just wanted to string this micro-theory along. My fourth and final theory is about the real reason why Wayland Park got caught. When we are apprehended by Jeremy Blair, he mentions that Wayland used an onion router as well as a firewall patch to try to break through the security. At first I believe the whole biometric security intimidation display, but after reading the comic I think I've come up with a more reasonable explanation on why Waylon was caught. If we can recall, two weeks prior to the storyline incident, there was an anonymous complaint to human resources. Pauline Glick and Paul Marion were sent out to investigate. Not knowing where to search first, Pauline decided to start off with the IT department. There they met with Michelle Haas. During their conversation with the lady, Paul mentions that the anonymous email to human resources was sent through an onion router. Since we already know that Michelle was the anonymous plaintiff, I hypothesized Wayland took inspiration from the incident and decided to reach out to Miles using the exact same method. Since Murkoff had already gained experience from the past issue, it makes the most sense that it was almost instant for Jeremy to discover who the whistleblower was. Two down, four to go. Hello everybody and welcome to the third installment of Analyzing the Murkoff Account. If you're an Outlast fan and you don't know what the Murkoff Account is, it's a comic series that extends Outlast lore far beyond anything the games can portray. There are six in total, each a deeper labyrinth than the other. In this video, I'm going to be discussing Volume 3 of the comic books. During my thesis, I'm going to be explaining every single thing that can be put together that someone may not understand. For example, if a specific event or location is mentioned by a character, I will give context behind what that individual said. Like a Spindletop Psychotherapy Clinic is mentioned, I will explain what this location is and why it's important to the main storyline. However, the prerequisite for my synopsis will be the narration of the comic book. The reason why this will happen first is that it's for those who have never read it before. That will hopefully drop some of the confusion someone may have. After these two steps happen, I will give my personal theories on the comic book. My hypothesis will be based on unanswered questions or things mentioned that are not able to be calculated in a narrow perspective. If you watch the other two videos I've created, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Without further delay, I give you the Murkoff account, Deep Searching Issue 3. The transnational Murkoff Corporation tirelessly pushes the frontier of scientific research and development, partnering with the greatest minds of tomorrow. Murkoff expands the reach of every branch of scientific inquiry, including gene therapy, behavioral therapy, information technology, and medicine. In the event of mistake or oversight, the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department comes in to minimize economic fallout. Mitigation officers are damage control. They are not here to save lives or help people. They are here to make sure it doesn't cost the company any more than it has to. Paul Marion and Pauline Glick, Murkoff Insurance and Mitigation Officers. Between jobs, I go home and see my daughter. Jeez, Alice, isn't this too scary for you? Dad, you don't like the doll I brought you. I'm 15. Well, then what should I bring you when I come back from work trips? Just come home more often. After the leak, things got a little out of hand at Mount Massive Asylum and something new was created. 
Mount Massive. This is going to be expensive. That's Jeremy Blair. We met him, didn't we? Yeah, he's lost weight. What the hell do you think could have done that to him? Let's go breathe some air that doesn't smell like a slaughterhouse septic tank. Video drives were wiped down sometime before dawn, but this is looking like a 100% fatal incident. There's a silver lining. Easier cleanup. Murkoff Rehabilitation Center. Of course we weren't that lucky. The initial whistleblower, Whalen Park, had escaped, and he made contact with Simon Peacock and Miles Upshur. Simon Peacock is obviously our chief concern, just exactly how much damage he did before he died. But Miles Upshur... Upshur was neutralized in the Mount Massive incident. Yes, neutralized. Of course. FBI on-site hospital, Detroit, Michigan. At the time, our biggest concern was finding Whalen Park, but a few days later, we caught wind of a connection to the most, uh, sensitive patient on Mount Massive. Billy Hope was the only patient at the facility who had successfully completed the experimental treatment. His mother, Tiffany, lived about 80 miles from the hospital. Billy? You came home. We knew Whalen Park had stolen miles up Shares Jeep. We traced the Jeep to a truck stop that offered bus service. Nothing here. Christ. Well, from here, Whalen Park could have bought a cash bus ticket or hitched a ride with some trucker. He could be anywhere. IT just got a ping on Miles Upshur's account. Somebody accessed his bank online from a cell phone tower outside of Nathrop, Colorado. Miles Upshur had no connections to the town of Nathrop, but then we ran it against Mount Massive patient files. Nathrop is where Billy Hope was born. His mother, Tiffany, still lived there. Tiffany said she didn't know Miles Upshur. Said she hadn't heard from Billy since he'd gone to Mount Massive, and said she'd been all alone out here for weeks. And Miss Hope, you've never visited Billy even once in all these years? It weren't allowed. They said it'd be bad for his treatment, like to have broke my heart, but a mother's gotta make sacrifices. He seemed cheerful. Any reason I shouldn't be? Seems like Billy would be a painful topic. There's always comforts in this world. You've had a man visiting you? My boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, he don't come around much no more. I imagine he misses his hat. You sure you never met a Miles Upshur? Maybe a friend of a friend? Upshur? Nah, never heard of him. Funny name. He's some kind of foreigner? And this is Billy? That's my Billy on Halloween. He's dressed as an alien Uberman. Well, my daughter used to read the alien Uberman funny books. The Invincible Alien Hero! Exclamation point. You collect glass figurines. They're crystal. Can I ask what is it y'all want here? I got things I could be doing. This is Sarovsky. Expensive. Be careful with that. I don't mean to be rude, but how can you afford all these? You don't mean to be rude, lady. I'm, I guess my money's my business, and I think I need to ask y'all to leave. Well, Billy's mom is full of shit. We should... What are you looking at? Um, nothing. I guess I thought I saw something. And yeah, Tiffany Hope there is lying through her teeth. You think we should keep an eye on her? Yeah, but not us. I'll put a hardline officer on it. We've got more important chickens to pluck. So, while a Murkoff grunt sat stakeout at Tiffany's trailer, we tried to get control of the Whalen Park situation, with zero leads on his whereabouts. So, we started a forensic gaslight. Sorry, forensic gaslight? We couldn't stop Whalen from posting whatever he wanted online, so we stole his identity and posted a long, backdated history of crazy shit under his name. Conspiracy theories, perversions, delusions. It's the most fun Paul let himself have. How do you spell fluoridation? Just look at your word balloon, or let your computer spell check it. I'm trying to make sure I spelt it believably wrong. Yeah, I'm listening. Can you see who it is? Must be the boyfriend. Lucky you. If there's sexy time, take pictures for me. They're gonna go inside. I'm gonna have to get closer. Got another man here, don't you? You drunken $2 slut. I swear to fucking God, Tiffany, even after I gave you my old TV. You paranoid as you always been, you ignorant hillbilly shitbird. It's all that laced weed and homemade talk radio. Lucky I even put up with your shit. I swear to God, you got a pussy like a dog's ear and a mouth that could drive baby Jesus himself to suicide. You're one to talk with your barely working Hitler looking half-ass excuse for a dick. I wish there was another man here. A real man. You even look at another man, I swear to fucking Christ, Tiffany. I'd kick your ass and urine into- Yeah, well you must think dog ears taste like fucking ice cream the way you- The truck just crashed. Go check it out. Keep this line open and keep talking to me. I'm approaching the truck and there's a lot of blood. A fucking lot of blood. 
Tell me everything you see. What is it, Agent? <laughs> Wall Rider. Fuck. Billy? Honey? I'll take care of you, Mom. Well, the word Wall Rider certainly unleashed the full monetized wrath of the Murkoff Corporation. They say the trucks would kill this thing, but we only get one shot at it. And we need the full manifestation to be focused in one area. And what exactly is the Wall Rider? No idea, sir. You know what it is. Maybe. But you won't tell me. Nope. And it could kill us. Most definitely. Great. Let's go check it out. Who the fuck are you people? What do you want from me? You can't do this. We need to find Billy. You fascist sons of bitches, you can't do this to me. All your thugs and guns hold me prisoner in my own home. You can't do this. This is America. Don't say it. Everybody's already thinking it. You need to get Billy to show himself. I told you, Billy ain't here. Ain't been here in years. Somebody shattered all your crystal figurines. And shipped one back together into an alien Uberman. You know, I gave my daughter a doll a few weeks ago, and I thought she hated it. Jeez, Alice, you really hate that thing, huh? Don't be such a nerd, Dad. I like that you got me something. And I just made it special for me. Billy Hope is here. I told you he ain't. Where the hell do you think I'd hide him? Ain't but two rooms of this goddamn thing, and... And... You're sure he's here? Pretty sure. You know, Tiffany, I bet I can guess where you got the money for all those Swarovski crystal figurines. Please, no matter what you've done to him, he's my little boy. You were paid well to give Billy Hope over to Mount Massive. I've heard they're even more generous when the test subjects don't have anything wrong with them to start with. You sold your boy, and he wasn't even sick. What the fuck? I loved you, Mom. Fucking run! Now! Pull the trigger! Hit the button! Do whatever fucking kills that thing! Congratulations. We killed it. At least they thought we'd killed the wall rider. While they mopped up the blood and vacuumed up the top secret dust, I climbed a hill. It hadn't died. It had just switched hosts. Before I start deep searching, I would just like to say I already discussed all the implications of page 2. In all of the comic books, page 2 is the exact same. Anyway, let's get on with the research. On page 3 of the comic book, we see Paul Marion and his daughter Allison Marion. They're presumably at home or at the hospital. However, I'm leaning toward the location being Paul's house because Allison says, Just come home more often. I could be reading into the semantical logistics of her statement, but since she said home specifically, it makes sense to assume that they're at Paul's house. At first glance, this connection seems microscopic, but in my opinion, it's important because it gives us insight into why Paul does what he does. Because of a rare hereditary blood disease, Allison Marion relies on her father to keep her alive using the benefits of the Murkoff Corporation's advanced pharmaceuticals and gene therapies. Recalling the other two comic books prior to this one, Paul doesn't work for Murkoff because he wants to. He's under their employment because he wants to save the only family he has left, even if that means destroying other families in the process. As we continue to page 4, we can clearly see Eddie Gleskin having some good old-fashioned necrophilia. There's no deeper meaning behind this, it's just funny. Well, actually, there's a little bit of lore I could explain from this image. Back when Eddie was a child, he was repeatedly molested and raped by his father and uncle. Because of these life-altering events that took place, that could explain why he became a molester and rapist during his time at Mount Massive. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree in this case. On the last panel of page 4, we can see the wall rider standing ominously over a group of dead Murkoff suppression officers. This information is pretty much universal, but the wall rider is Billy Hope, the guy that was in a large sphere at the end of the first game. On page 5, we follow Pauline Glick and Paul Marion as they arrive at Mount Massive Asylum. Pauline makes the observation that the corpse on the ground is Jeremy Blair. If we can recall, Jeremy was killed by the wall rider at the end of Whistleblower. As the two make their way inside the building, Paul searches through a computer. I'm assuming that this is his computer and he's checking the asylum's incident report. After looking at the report, Paul makes the assumption that the event was 100% fatal. However, since all of us most likely played out less in the DLC, I can only assume he means the event was 100% fatal because of the tactical division sent in by Murkoff. There isn't any other way to look at it considering we were being chased throughout the asylum by living people. But that still doesn't make sense because we know Wayland Park escapes at the end of Whistleblower. Ergo, this isn't a 100% fatal incident. Since this false impression is being assumed as fact by certain Murkoff employees, variants and potentially other staff members could be roaming the nearby forest presumed dead by the corporation. The implications of this are enormous. Also, since Paul noticed the video drives were wiped clean, how did the tactical division or other employees see if any variants escaped? They couldn't have possibly watched all the footage from every security camera in the facility in that short amount of time. So why delete the footage and then assume all variants are dead? 
It just doesn't make sense to me. On page 6, this is even partially confirmed by Pauline. However, she doesn't even consider the possibility of other people escaping. One thing on page 6, however, gave me an ominous feeling. When told Miles Upshur was neutralized, Pauline adds emphasis to the fact. I will explain why she does this in a little bit. The story then shifts to Billy Hope's involvement in Project Wallrider. Everything is pretty much self-explanatory until we hit page 8 and page 21. On page 8, Pauline and Paul find Miles' Jeep abandoned at a bus stop. Paul makes the conclusion that Waylon either had to buy a bus ticket or hitchhiked with a truck driver. I personally don't believe Waylon bought a bus ticket for the sheer fact that he wouldn't have any cash on him. Assuming a random stranger didn't pay for him, the only way for Waylon to have gotten a bus ticket is if Miles left his wallet in the Jeep prior to entering Mount Massive. I guess this could be a possibility. However, the sliver of hope that this is the case is completely eradicated after Pauline tells Paul that Miles accessed his bank in Nathrop. To refill the can of worms, this means Miles didn't leave his wallet in his Jeep, but kept it in his pocket. And the only way for him to access anything is if he was still alive. On page 21, I have a bit of circumstantial evidence for this. Anyway, Paul and Pauline make their way to Nathrop. Before I move on to the next important page, aka 21, let me return to the original topic of how Waylon found transportation. I believe Waylon either hitchhiked or made contact with Simon Peacock. I can't really elaborate because there's literally no evidence, but it's something I wanted to add. By the way, this sort of counts as a theory, however it's too short to be put in the theory section of the video. Please forgive me in that respect. Alright, on to page 21. We are currently in Tiffany Hope's trailer. Pauline and Paul suspect Tiffany is hiding the wall rider. As a way to draw out the entity, or should I say Billy, Pauline reveals that Tiffany sold her son to Murkoff so she could obtain money. Hearing this knowledge infuriates the wall rider and the entity ends up killing Tiffany. When I read this panel, something intrigued me. When the wall rider approached Tiffany, it said, You sold your boy, and he wasn't even sick. With this quote in mind, I believe Miles was talking through the wall rider. There would be no reason for Billy to talk in the third person. If this was Billy, he would have said, You sold me. I wasn't even sick. I know we're in the realm of semantics, but it just makes conversational sense. Also, the fact that Miles accessed his bank account near Tiffany's location proves that this is him. If you want more evidence, let's go to page 11, where we see two entities on top of Tiffany's trailer. If it was just Billy, why would there be two entities? This has to mean Miles and Billy were together during the visit. One last thing. If Miles was a wall rider, that would explain why on page 6, Pauline added emphasis when the mitigation officers told her Miles was neutralized. I think she came to the conclusion that the two of them were working together at that moment. Alright, now that the deep search is done with, it's time for discussing the theories. My first theory pertains to the Murkoff Tactical Division. Did they lie about the fatality percentage after the incident? I personally believe they missed some variants during their sweep. Since they destroyed all the video footage before even reviewing it, there is a high probability that there are patients in the nearby forest. However, that's assuming they were sloppy by accident. There is the possibility that they did know of a few patients escaping, but decided not to report it because that would have added a lot of extra paperwork. In some ways, this is sort of a cop-out, but it would make sense. My second theory is about Murkoff's knowledge on the swarm. More specifically, if they think Miles is alive through the wall rider. Obviously, we know that Pauline thinks this is the case, but does the entire corporation think this? I have no way of proving or disproving what they know, but it would make sense for them to hear about Pauline's account of the situation. Based on that, Executive Burkhoff officials would be aware of the potential collaboration between Miles and Billy. Would this be relevant to the overall story? Probably not, but I guess it's cool to think about. Three have been conceived, and three need to be created. Howdy everybody that still craves Outlast content, and welcome to the fourth installment of Deep Searching the Murkoff account. If you're the type of person like me, a longtime Outlast fan who doesn't know anything about the comic books, then I'd say this is the video for you. Prepare to educate yourself on some interesting in-universe lore. There are six comic books in total, each of them a maze-like system that needs to be explored and mapped out. In this video, I'm going to be discussing volume four of the comic books. During my thesis, I'm going to be explaining every single thing that can be put together which someone may not understand. For example, if a specific location is mentioned by a character, I will give context behind what that individual said. However, the prerequisite of my synopsis will be the narration of the comic book. The reason why this will happen first is that it's for those who have never read it before. That will hopefully drop some of the confusion some of you may have. Sadly, after these two steps happen, I won't give any theories for this video in particular. Everything was pretty much straightforward and nothing called for my hypotheses. You'll see what I mean. Without any further explanation, I present to you the deep search. The Transnational Murkoff Corporation tirelessly pushes the frontier of scientific research and development. Partnering with the greatest minds of tomorrow, Murkoff expands the reach of every branch of scientific inquiry, including gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. 
In the event of mistake or oversight, the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department comes in to minimise the economic fallout. Mitigation officers are damage control. They are not here to save lives or help people, they are here to make sure it doesn't cost the company any more than it has to. Residents of Whalen Park, Boulder Co. The whistleblower that brought down Mount Massive, Whalen Park, burned his house down when he fled with his family. Whalen wasn't fucking around about disappearing. We will sift the ashes, but our chances of finding a lead in this are vanishingly slim. Yeah. What you got there? Photo of his family. The two boys. I hate it when they have families. Since when did Merck of her women and kids? Sorry, that was in bad taste. FBI, on-site hospital, Detroit. We flew east to look through Miles Upshaw's apartment. Miles died at Mount Massive. We were just hoping for some connection to Simon Peacock and Wayland Park. Residents of Miles Upshaw, Washington, DC. Yeah, I used to see Miles jogging sometimes. He's been gone for a while now, but I saw him back just last night. Miles Upshaw, here, last night? That's not possible. I saw him, standing right over there. Drove my dog's bad shit, which is weird. They always used to like him. That woman said Miles Upshaw was here last night. Not likely, it would take his days to find him under all this shit if he was. Guess we better get started then. It's garbage. Is some of this garbage moving? Ants, the place is infested. That's exactly like the ants I saw in Colorado. What do you mean? Somebody accessed Miles Upshaw's accounts from the Excel Tower near Tiffany Hope's trailer, and now those same ants here. Wait, are you saying somebody emailed Miles Upshaw a, a swarm of ants? Yeah. Email demands. Not the strangest thing I've seen. These look like passwords. Ah! Little fucker bit me. Black cans don't bite. Ah, fuck! They're all over me. Jesus. Not there, not there. Mother fuck, fuck, fuck. Water, water. Ouch, ouch, fuck. Ah, god damn it, make room. I'm, I'm coming in. Fuck this. It's not working. We need fire. Ouch, ouch, fuck. Close off, close off. Do me, do me. <sighs> fuck. Fuck that. Gym clothes. Got anything I could wear? Nope. What the fuck am I gonna do? Hey, that's the, the same homeless guy from Colorado. That's not possible. I'm sure it's him. He's been following us. Hey! Stop! Paul? <sighs> Jesus, where'd you go? You work for Murkoff, don't you? Who are you? I believe you've heard of me. My name is Simon Peacock. What's your name? You've been following us. Yes, I've been watching you, and you've got something most Murkoff running dog mercenaries don't. I'm not a mercenary. You've got shame. You know what you're doing is wrong. It's a job, but you're somebody who chased after me despite the fact that you're injured and naked. Who does that? I can't stand not knowing. Tell me your name. No, I've read your files, Peacock. You used to work for Murkoff, and six years ago you leaked the company files and then vanished. Been off the map since, encouraging of whistleblowers. You're trying to destroy Murkoff. Of course I am, they're evil. You work for the devil. What's Project Wallrider? You're protecting Will and Park? You'll never find him. I couldn't tell you even if I knew. Willful ignorance. Of course, I remember that. Always let me sleep some nights. How do you sleep? How do you justify working for people you know are evil? Mount Massive was just a pebble in a pond, an experiment on individuals that is where the real sickness spreads. If you cannot look at what's there and not eat yourself hollow with shame, you're not human anymore. Those are coordinates. I need your help. I need somebody still inside Murkoff. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you you're going to help me. I have to do my job. What are you... The fuck? <laughs> freeze! It's Simon Peacock! I said freeze, motherfucker! I'm leaving. Please don't make me hurt you. Okay...
Thanks. That was Simon Peacock? Yeah. He's a monster. Yeah. What was he shoving in your face? Foam insulation, I think. Why? Fuck do I know. Let's get you some clothes before I get too turned on. I figured it out later. He was using the foam to take an impression of my teeth. Dental records, my identification, he wasn't done with me. And we weren't done with him. I was more certain than ever that evidence inside Miles Upshaw's apartment would lead us to Simon Peacock and Park. We had Miles Upshaw's house fumigated, pumped it full of an ungodly amount of poison. It was Aunt Dresden. After they'd aired it out, we went back inside. Everything was gone. The ants had chewed it to dust. And the ants were gone. Or maybe powdered. Everything was coated in a black dust. This make any sense to you? Nothing I feel too good about, but it at least closes the books at Mount Massive for now. The evidence couldn't get any more thoroughly destroyed. There is one more thing. Coordinates I got from Sam and Peacock. It's an empty plot of land about 80 miles northwest of Flagstaff. He said there was Murkoff business there. And nothing I know of. I wouldn't put too much faith in anything I heard from an animated pile of maggots. Maybe we should check it out. Nah, leave it alone. Murkoff will sick us up to it if they want us to dig. Doesn't matter until Wayland Park sticks his head up. This case is done. You should get home. Spend some time with your daughter. Make sure she doesn't grow up to be somebody like me. Mount Massive was a pebble in a pond, an experiment on individuals. This is where the real sickness spreads. Before I start analyzing the comic book, I would just like to say that in my first video on this series, I already discussed the ramifications on page 2. Page 2 is the exact same amongst all issues. Anyways, let's get into it. Our story starts off with Pauline Glick and Paul Marion sifting through the remains of Wayland Park's burnt down home. If we can recall from the last comic book, issue 3, the duo discovered the abandoned jeep that Wayland used to escape Mount Massive. To piece together the timeline, after escaping the asylum, Wayland must have gone to his house to retrieve his family, amongst other unknown items, and then came in contact with Simon Peacock. Since we're missing a lot of detail, I can't think of any logistics that may have taken place between these three blunt events. To reiterate, events are leaving the asylum at Miles' jeep, going to his residence, and getting discovered by Simon. At this point in time, Wayland's location is unknown, and honestly, I wouldn't mind if he didn't make another appearance. His story became completed once he uploaded the footage from Mount Massive. Anyway, enough rambling, let's continue. As Pauline and Paul investigate the crime scene, the faint image of a homeless man with a purple tie can be seen sulking in the background. This anonymous figure will have a bearing on the story in a few moments. Something I would like to add is that when Paul mentions that he hates it when Murkoff includes families during their targeted operations, Pauline, in response, makes a joke about the disheartening situation. This in turn upsets Paul, so Pauline swiftly apologizes. The reason why this comment affected Paul in a negative way is because he is a family man who lives to protect his daughter. He understands that Wayland is just trying to do the right thing by saving his family. In fact, I would argue that he would have done the very same thing if he were on the opposite side of things. I guess a person with foresight could call this foreshadowing, wink wink. We then continue to page 4 where interestingly enough is revealed that the FBI on-site hospital that Paul is located in is situated in Detroit, Michigan. The relevance of the minor detail is very minimal but I think it's cool so I'm including it. Apparently Paul thinks Miles Upshur is dead even though we know Pauline thinks otherwise. Not only that but there's a substantial amount of evidence proving against this false way of thinking. Despite the fact that we literally saw Miles walk out of the asylum at the end of Whistleblower, there are minor phrase inconsistencies, which I mentioned in the last video, that don't add up to the Miles is dead comments in the comic book. There's also the scene where we can see two figures on top of Tiffany Hope's trailer in issue 3. This, however, is a conjecture, but it adds to my overall argument. There's one more thing, but I'll mention it later. After a bit of contextual conversation with the FBI agent, Paul then talks about how he and Pauline catch a flight to Washington DC to investigate Miles' house. This doesn't count as my one more thing to prove my point statement I referenced earlier, but when Paul talks to a woman before investigating Miles' house, the woman makes it clear that she saw Miles the night prior to the agent showing up. I guess you could chalk this up to the information being unreliable because of the low visibility, but this still can't be discarded. 
Pauline and Paula enter the house and begin their investigation into Miles. However, before they get far, the duo are attacked by a swarm of ants, which are pretty bluntly explained to have been emailed to the house. This just sounds like completely unrealistic bullshit, but I digress. Besides this, we have Callium's absolutely stellar performance during this scene. Let me just play it again because I love it so much. Water, water. Ouch, ouch, fuck. Ah, god damn it, make room. I'm, I'm coming in. Ouch, ouch, fuck. Close off, close off. Do me, do me. <sighs> fuck. <laughs> yes, that does bring a smile to my face. Alrighty, memes aside, this is where I hopefully can convince you guys that Miles is still alive. Why the hell would the wall rider have any interest in going to Miles' residence for any reason? Not to mention, how would the entity even know how to find this location? The only possible answer, which I can see, is that Miles is the wall rider along with Billy Hope. Miles brings the dominant force to motivate Billy to look beyond his own pain so that he can permanently destroy the Murkoff Corporation. This can't possibly be a theory because all this evidence has the subtlety of a shotgun pointed at your face. However, if you have an explanation that can deteriorate my statement, please share them in the comment section. The next bit of important information lies on page 8, where we see the homeless man with the purple tie. This is obviously the same man from page 3. Paul notices and begins to pursue the figure while almost completely naked, like a true man. However, he runs out of steam and loses track of the man, but bumps into coordinates as he takes a breather. These coordinates are revealed to be where Temple Gate is. On the same page, the mysterious man revealed to be Simon Peacock. The two of them have a pretty straightforward conversation until Pauline shows up. The next bit of information that could be considered useful or interesting is on page 20. Paul reveals that Simon took his teeth and prints to access his dental records, subsequently accessing his identification. Why he would do this, I have no idea, but just a little hint. This piece of information plays into an event that happens in the next issue. On page 22, Pauline tells Paul he shouldn't worry about the coordinates Simon gave him. This obviously doesn't rest well with Paul. The reason why Pauline doesn't want Paul to look into the coordinates is because he's too moral to know what the experiments are at Temple Gate. Basically, it's above his pay grade. On page 23, Pauline says something that's pretty interesting to her character, and that is, you should get home, spend some time with your daughter, and make sure she doesn't grow up to be somebody like me. I honestly find this to be heart-wrenching. What are Pauline's motivations for working at Murkoff? Is she being blackmailed to work, or does she have a loved one that also needs assistance from the corporation? I honestly have no idea, but seeing her character with this deep internal depression is very, very sad. I can't wait to see her character growth in future installments, whether that be in the comic books or even in the games. The last page, page 24, shows a pregnant woman and an injured man walking through what appears to be a desert. At this stage in the comic books, these two are unknown. Four video essays have been analyzed and only two additional ones need to follow. Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth installment of Deep Searching and Analyzing the Murkoff Account. If you like learning about Outlast related lore, as well as exploring potentially true theories in the history of the game, then I'd say this is the video for you! Prepare to expand your understanding. There are six comic books in total, each of them a labyrinth-like system that needs to be explored and mapped out. In this video, I'm going to be discussing volume 5 of the comic books. During my thesis, I'm going to be explaining every single element that some may find difficult to understand. For example, if a specific event or location is mentioned by a character, I will give context behind what that individual said. However, the prerequisite of my synopsis will be the narration of the comic book. The reason why this will happen first is because it's for those who have never read it before. That will hopefully drop most of the confusion some may have. After these two steps have happened, I will give my personal theories on the comic book. My hypotheses will be based on unanswered questions or things mentioned that are not able to be calculated in a narrow perspective. Now that we got that out of the way, it's time for the video. I hope you enjoy the second to last layer. The Transnational Murkoff Corporation tirelessly pushes the frontier of scientific research and development. Partnering with the greatest minds of tomorrow, Murkoff expands the reach of every branch of scientific inquiry, including gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. In the event of mistake or oversight, the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department comes in to minimize economic fallout. Mitigation officers are damage control. They are not here to save lives or help people. They are here to make sure it doesn't cost the company any more than it has to. Arizona. He ain't gonna let us get away. Every step we take, the less power he got. We'll get to the wicked part of the world and God himself ain't even gonna be able to find us. 
residence of Paul Marion. Do you know if Yeshua Hanastri was a real person, like in the Bible? Never heard of him. When's that book report due? Thursday. You're getting an early jump. Figured I'd be too beat to work on Wednesday. The transfusion and all. You didn't touch your dinner. I wasn't hungry. It's not like I need the extra calories. Alice, honey, that's crazy. You're a string bean. A beautiful string bean. Shut up, Dad. God. Hey, there's somebody messing with our mailbox. Hey! 360-0551 North, 1120-34 West. Your daughter is connected. FBI on-site hospital. My partner and I had agreed not to investigate the coordinates Simon Peacock had given us. Turns out I was lying. Arizona. Hey, Glick, it's Paul. Glick? Pauline? Can you hear me? Hey, Paul, yeah. I hear you now. Where are you? It's noisy. At the hospital. Sorry to interrupt you on a Sunday. Residence of Pauline Glick. You're not interrupting anything. I was just folding laundry, listening to Prairie Home Companion. Good. Good. Listen, I don't think I'm going to make it into the office tomorrow. I have to spend some time with Alice. No worries. We all need personal time. I rented the biggest, most jacked up all-terrain SUV they'd rent me, and it's still crapped out about 20 miles short of the coordinates. Oh, fuck me. No service. I guess the heat in the sun got to me. Heavenly God. Dad? What's wrong? Are they out of hot chocolate? I was back in that night, 13 years ago, watching my wife die. Multiple perforations of the intestines spread throughout your wife's blood had to induce a coma in order to arrest progress, internal bleeding. Surgery is no longer an option. Your wife is dead, Mr. Marion. I'm so sorry. Alice! I'm so sorry, honey. I, I didn't mean- What the fuck? We don't want no trouble, mister. I'm just gonna take your pistol. Who Who are you? Hey, hey, take it easy. Jesus fucking Christ. Don't you take that name in vain. Safety's on. Alright, who are you? Who's the girl? And Jesus, how pregnant is she? I'm not gonna hurt you. You'll need help. I guess the shock got to me. When I woke up, it was full dark. I followed her trail for a couple miles. I kept seeing my dead wife. Joanne? Mm-hmm. That's all you got? Mm-hmm. I said I was seeing my dead wife. I heard you. It's the least crazy thing you've told me so far. Fair enough. So, by the time I'd caught up with the pregnant girl, She'd found a road and lucked onto a ride. Hey, wait! Two pieces of luck. I managed to get the license plate number. My phone was back in range of signal. Hey Glick, it's me. You are in such deep shit. I know. You lied to me. You went off the reservation. I actually think I might be on a reservation. Like Indians, or First Nations, or- What the fuck are you doing, Paul? I fucked up. Don't fuck yourself any deeper. I'm on my way. In the morning, a family on their way to the Grand Canyon found me and took me to the hospital. Spill. Pauline Glick got to the hospital six hours after I did. I told her everything. She wasn't impressed. Okay, number one, you work for Murkoff, not Simon Peacock. Number two, you don't interfere with any ongoing experiments. We only enter the equation when the science is done and the side effects need mopping up. Shit, you don't even know if this is an experiment. And number three, fuck you. You don't work without me. We're partners, you stupid motherfucker. So don't say you're sorry. I hate that. You want the silver lining to your shit show? I traced this license plate number on your palm. That pregnant girl's a patient in this hospital. Don't suppose you brought me a suit. I even brought you a tie. Hope yellow's alright. Your dead wife in the desert. 
You call it a vision, not a hallucination. It felt real. I could smell the hospital, I could smell my daughter, like that little kid smell. It felt real. First rule in the Murkoff playbook is don't get high on your own product. Yeah, but I'm wondering if I really killed that kid. I'm wondering about that girl. The girl's real. She's on record here. But her pregnancy, what if it's psychosomatic? Like the woman at Mount Massive. Could there be a connection there? It's a healthy baby boy. Remarkably healthy in fact, considering the state of the mother. She was unconscious when she arrived here. You don't know her name? We've got her on record as Jane Doe. What about brain injury? You said there were anomalies in the CT scan. The scan must have been corrupted. What looks like a lesion in the amygdala, but perfectly symmetrical. Damn thing. Murkoff Rehabilitation Center. Miss Glick, is there more to your testimony? Yes, of course, excuse me, I was just... The lesions in the girl's brain match the neutral scanning common to the morphogenic engine exposure, like the patient at Mount Massive. Could we see those brain scans? They're already off to the lab, but we have copies. Test results in the lab scans. The girl evidence all of it. This had become a matter of containment. We'd love to meet the patient. This is Jane Doe. She's been unconscious since she got here. But the little guy in here has been kicking up a storm. We stood by Jane Doe's beside for hours. Then Paul noticed something. Is that a tattoo on her chest? A globe. No wheels. Wheels within wheels. That's biblical. From the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel? Oh, Papa, Papa. You can't have him, you can't. I'll die before I'll let you kill him. Fuck. I seen the messenger, and I know I ain't burdened with the enemy. My blood is true. I've sipped at the fountain and borne the pain and marks of salvation. You ain't gonna take my baby. You ain't, ain't. She's having a seizure. Get a doctor. Doctor. It was then I was certain what we had found when we found Jane Doe. What had to be done? We lost her. We need to leave, now. She's dead, gone. There's nothing we could do, minimal footprint. I realized too late I was operating above my security clearance. I hadn't figured out yet the trap Simon Peacock had led us into. What had been waiting for us out in the desert. Are you sure she was dead? Yeah, case closed. It's sad, still, I gotta get home. Alice has a transfusion tomorrow. I said I'd be there. You're a good dad. You always take care of your girl. Home again. Alice? You home? Alice? You work for us now. We still had to clean up that body Paul left in the desert. The boy. We grid searched a 40 mile radius surrounding his abandoned rental vehicle. We didn't find Dick. We never found out what happened to that body, if in fact it ever existed. Before I start deep searching, I just would like to say I already discussed all the implications of page 2. In all the comic books, page 2 is the exact same. Anyway, let's get on with the research. Our story starts off in Arizona, with two characters blindly running through the desert at night. The woman is named Anna Lee, the man, Paul. According to the Outlast wiki, Paul is the brother of Ethan, making him Anna Lee's uncle, once removed. Presumably they're coming from Temple Gate, just briefly escaping the clutches of the cult. Paul appears to be injured, but we don't know who inflicted this damage upon him. I have my own little theory about how this injury was obtained, however, I'll save that for the theory section of the video. During the escape, Annalise says, He ain't gonna let us get away. I believe she's referring to Sullivan Knopf. Obviously there's no evidence for this, but it just makes the most narrative sense out of any other possible explanation. We then transfer to Paul Marion's residence, where we see Allison Marion and Paul cleaning up after dinner. They have a little conversation about homework, with Allison mentioning that she needs to get her transfusion on Wednesday. This means that Allison can make occasional visits from the hospital after her experimental treatment. I personally thought she had to stay at the hospital indefinitely until she was finally cured of her rare blood disease. However, that doesn't appear to be the case. I guess the treatment is sort of like chemotherapy, where you only have to periodically go to the hospital to receive care. This could loosely imply that the blood disease Allison has potentially could be a form of cancer that's currently unknown in the Outlast universe. I wish I could elaborate beyond this point, but since I'm not a cancer expert, this possibility will have to be halted, at least on my end. Also, if Allison did have some type of rare blood cancer, I'm fairly certain the comic book would have mentioned the type, even if it was extremely rare. 
After they're done with their conversation, Allison notices a mysterious man rifling through the mailbox. Paul immediately runs toward the mysterious figure, but he sprints away. This is obviously Simon Peacock and his now signature ensemble. What I find a little weird is that Simon appears to be strongly fixated on the Marion family, without any prior information about them. My first guess was that Simon Peacock had some type of access to Murkoff documents relating to staff, but after thinking about it, I don't think that's the case anymore. Besides the fact that Murkoff has an iron grip on all documents, including top secret ones, if Simon had any type of incriminating evidence against the corporation, he wouldn't need to involve himself in any of the lives of the employees, let alone the litigation officers. Otherwise, he would have published his findings and obliterated the company with the evidence. I believe he doesn't have any type of resource to utilize, and in fact, out of pure coincidence, chose Paul Marion when he went to Whalen Park's residence. After doing a bit more unscrupulous digging on Paul, Simon would have become immediately familiar with his life. This would include learning about Allison Marion and her treatment. Seeing this information as possible leverage, he now looks at Paul as a perfect entry token to access Murkoff from the inside, perhaps even planning to use his daughter in some type of maniacal way. Now I know what you're thinking, Michael, this is a goddamn theory, and sure, it could be considered as one, but I just believe that there's too much evidence to even consider that this is a hypothesis. Everything just seems to fit seamlessly together, so I'm just going to count it as a fact. After Paul reaches the mailbox, he discovers a piece of paper with coordinates and the message, your daughter is connected. Side note, the coordinates from issue 4 are different than this issue's coordinates. The original numbers start off as 360557N, and these numbers are 360557N. There's obviously an extra zero in these new coordinates, however I'm going to treat this as a continuity error instead of a whole new location. Anyway, back on track. There are many different interpretations of the quote, your daughter is connected. This could refer to Allison's involvement as a patient, or perhaps Allison is being used by Murkoff for some nefarious reason. I'll explore most of the possibilities in the theory section. We continue to the FBI on-site hospital, where we are in the present. Paul tells the FBI agent that he and Pauline decided not to investigate the coordinates given by Simon Peacock. However, he went behind Pauline's back and investigated anyway. I believe Paul did this because he was curious about the coordinates that were given by Simon Peacock, as well as because he was fearing for his daughter's safety should Pauline find out and report his insubordination. Pages 6 to 13 are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm going to jump over to page 14. However, I would like to mention that on page 9, the reason why Paul's wife died was because she had the exact same blood disease Allison has. It's an unknown hereditary illness. Alright, on to page 14. Paul, covered in blood, calls Pauline to inform her on his situation and receive help. However, Pauline surprisingly already knows the logistics. I find this to be pretty intriguing considering she had no idea of Paul's plan originally. In the next section, I'll have a theory about this. On page 18, Paul and Pauline discover Annalise's tattoo resting on her chest. Hit with realization, Pauline makes the decision that she needs to kill Anna to contain the Templegate experiment from reaching the public. We then see the aftermath of the strangulation on page 20. I found this moment extremely sad in the case of Anna Lee and Pauline. For Anna, she died in vain and never ended up rescuing her baby from damnation and death. As for Pauline, although her actions make her borderline irredeemable, we can clearly see that she feels terrible about snuffing out the lives of a mother and her unborn child. If anything else, these events honestly invoke my curiosity. If she clearly has a soul, then why would she do such despicable things for the corporation? What are her motivations? Sadly, there is a distinct possibility that we will never find out. Paul then arrives at his house, but immediately discovers that his daughter was kidnapped. It's unknown if the kidnappers were affiliated with Simon Peacock, but it's definitely a possibility considering the beginning of the comic book. Simon is the only outside entity that knows of Paul's job circumstances. A human finger is found on the floor. We can only presume that it's Allison's finger. There are two more pages after this sequence, but they are self-explanatory. Now that we're done analyzing the comic book, it's time for my theories based on certain sections. How did Paul receive his injury? On page 3 of the comic book, when we witness Anna Lee and Paul running through the Arizona desert, we can see that Paul sustained an injury on his right side. This could have easily been a knife wound or some type of sharp penetrating object, however I believe the injury was from Lard Byron. If Paul was stabbed from the front, then obviously blood would be coming from the front. But on page 10 and 11, we can clearly see that there is blood coming from Paul's back. The only way I can see this being possible is if Lard Byron shot an arrow toward Paul, striking him in the back and exiting cleanly through the front. Even though Lard was the leader of the scold, he still would have been loyal to Sullivan Noth because he wasn't a heretic so he most likely did everything he could to prevent the Antichrist from escaping Temple Gate. With this motivation in mind, I believe he shot Paul, but failed to kill him. You could say somebody stabbed Paul with a really long spike, but I believe, if that were the case, he would have been killed off by the attacker because of the intimate proximity. 
Was Paul and Anna Lee in an incestuous relationship? I personally don't believe that incest occurred between Paul and Anna Lee, despite the fact that the two of them were being hunted down during the entire escape attempt. I think it would be against the Lord's wishes for one to fornicate with an individual who was a part of the same family. Keep in mind, even though these two act like heretics, they only found out that Annalie had to sacrifice her child hours prior to the escape attempt, not leaving any time for there to be coitus. I bring up the heretics because I do believe they would become incestuous, considering that orgy scene. I know this is more like disproving a theory, but I wanted to add it nonetheless. Does Allison Marion have anorexia? On page 4, Allison says to her father, I wasn't hungry. It's not like I need the extra calories. Paul snaps back by saying, Allison, honey, that's crazy. You're a string bean, a beautiful string bean. Perhaps because of the experimental treatment Allison is receiving from Murkoff, she has developed some type of eating disorder, possibly anorexia. As Paul pointed out, Allison is extremely thin, and since she is worried about extra calories, this could be considered her being paranoid about gaining weight. I do have to make this clear. If you or a loved one has an eating disorder, make sure to reach out to somebody you can trust. What does the quote, your daughter is connected, represent? On page 5, when Paul receives a scrap of paper with the temple gate coordinates, there is a little message saying, your daughter is connected. I believe this could mean Simon Peacock has information about Alice and Marion's treatment and the true intentions behind Murkoff. What if the corporation is using Paul's daughter as a ground zero patient experiment? Or at the very least, what if they're collecting data and using that information to negatively affect a different individual? There's obviously no evidence for any of these claims, but I certainly wouldn't put it past Murkoff to do something like that. There is one more thing that's a bit anticlimactic. Simon could have just been foreshadowing the kidnapping that he would be involved with at the end of the comic book. Who knows for sure? Does Pauline direct porn during her free time? On page 6, when Paul talks to Pauline over the phone, we can clearly see Pauline and two other naked women in front of a camera. This could show that Pauline is some type of porn director in her spare time. Perhaps she likes to watch intimacy, knowing she could never experience such pleasures because of the corporation. Maybe Pauline knows if she experiences a connection with another person, that could be used against her if she decides to rebel, similar to Paul Marion's daughter and how she was used as leverage. Everybody, except for asexuals, has a sexual desire, so maybe I'm overthinking this scene. It's more than likely that Pauline just wants to experience some action, like practically every other human being. How did Pauline find out about Paul's insubordination? On page 14, Paul calls Pauline for assistance after he's ambushed by the other Paul. However, Pauline miraculously already knows where Paul is. How could this be? Well, what if Pauline was tasked to track Paul's movements? She clearly says, you lied to me, you went off reservation. I believe this statement solidifies this theory. How could she possibly know Paul left anywhere without there being a tracker embedded in his clothing or on his phone? Here's a little side query that I found interesting in regards to when Pauline says, you went off reservation. Could this mean Paul has native roots? If Pauline is referring to Paul's house from the beginning of the comic book, then I'd say so. Obviously, not all inhabitants of reservations are Native American, but it's still a big possibility that should be considered. Did Murkoff agents shave Annalie's hair? In Alice 2, when Blake stumbles across Ethan, the father of Annalie, Blake describes Anna as having a haircut that resembles a boy's. Clearly, in the comic books, Anna is shown to have very long hair, so I was sort of confused putting two and two together. However, I thought of something that might explain the phenomenon. What if separate Murkoff agents arrived at the hospital where Anna Lee was murdered and shaved her hair? They could have done this to conceal her identity, although this wouldn't make that much sense considering nobody knew her identity in the first place. The obvious answer is that this is a continuity mistake, but I personally like to believe this was done for a reason. At the time of writing the script, it's been exactly one year since the very first comic book Deep Search. I sort of can't believe this miniseries is coming to an end. It honestly feels like yesterday I started writing the first entry, but there's no need to be emotional because there are plans in the works. I welcome everybody to the sixth installment of Deep Searching the Murkoff account. If you like imbuing yourself with knowledge on all things Outlast, including non-canon theories, then this is the perfect video for you. There are six comic books, each of them a treasure trove of information that need to be explored and broadcast. In this video, I'm going to be discussing Volume 6, aka the last issue of the comic books. During my thesis, I'm going to be explaining every single element that some may have found difficult to understand. For example, if a specific event or location is mentioned by a character, I will give context behind what that individual said. However, the prerequisite of my synopsis will be the narration of the comic book. 
The reason why this will happen first is that it's for those who have never read it before. That will hopefully drop most of the confusion some of you may have. After these two steps happen, I will give my personal theories on the comic book. My hypothesis will be based on unanswered questions or things mentioned that are not able to be calculated in a narrow perspective. Before the main topic of this video commences, I would just like to say that I created a Patreon for my channel. If you would like to support me in my endeavors, then I'd recommend checking it out. Anyway, now that we got that out of the way, it's time for the video. I hope you enjoy this last exploration. The Transnational Murkoff Corporation tirelessly pushes the frontier of scientific research and development. Partnering with the greatest minds of tomorrow, Murkoff expands the reach of every branch of scientific inquiry, including gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. In the event of mistake or oversight, the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department comes in to minimize economic fallout. Mitigation officers are damage control. They are not here to save lives or help people. They are here to make sure it doesn't cost the company any more than it has to. Paul Marion and Pauline Glick, Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Officers. There we go, my child. Every last drop of salvation. Your children are waiting for you in heaven. God does not pour half measures. The storm is abating. All these undeserved blessings. Seven hours later. Where's Paul Marion? Sorry, Agent Glick. He's still not answering. Send people to his house. He was in Templegate weeks ago. Somebody outside Murkoff connected the dots between Mount Massive and Templegate, and they've been feeding Marion information. That's no good. I'd put my money on Simon Peacock, and if we find him, I'll put electrodes on him. How many bodies are we looking at? Hundreds. It'll take us days to get them all sorted. A lot of these local corpses show signs of cyanide poisoning. God damn, this guy's heavy. Well, that doesn't look like cyanide. Yeah, a lot of them got creative about dying. The woman's real name is a mystery. Multiple traumas. Took a lot of whatever killed her to get the job done. By her teeth, I'd guess she's not a local. This is her, right? Lynn something? Last name sounds like a crustacean you're not supposed to eat? Langerman. How did you know? She was at the hospital last week, asking questions about the escaped Templegate woman. Fucking Paul Marion. He was supposed to be making sure she and her husband, Blake, didn't find this place. We got one breathing here. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Is that from Wrath of Khan? It's actually the Book of Job, by way of Moby. I know what it is, Agent. You don't have to try to impress me. Well, holy shit. It's him. It's Blake. Though his eyes are all pupil, completely catatonic. What's the closest black facility with ME-compatible forensic psych? Elrich? Afraid so. Well, take him there. We need to dig into his head. Don't be gentle. They rarely are. Agent Glick, our guy just broke down the door of Paul Marion's. No sign of him or his daughter, but there was blood on the walls. Looks like something was written and smeared away. Agent Glick, what do you want to do? Find Paul Marion. Actually, no. Do me a favor and find his corpse, because if he's still alive, he's fucking dangerous. Where's my daughter? You're asking the wrong question. I'll still help you find the answer, but you'll need to trust me. We have to find the wall rider. Murkoff destroyed the wall rider. What about Miles Upshur? Dead. And Billy Hope? Dead twice. And you found nothing in Templegate. How about you just tell me whatever it is you want to tell me? I don't know much, except that what Murkoff made of me was a rough draft, and what they stumbled onto when Miles Upshur found Billy Hope and the Wall Rider is the masterpiece. The morphogenic engine process needs a delivery mechanism, a method of infection. At Mount Massive, in the lab, they could customize the process to the patient, force it into their brains with video, mold the nightmares to open their minds, but out in the world, it's not surprising religion would be such an effective delivery mechanism. God's communicating with men. God's dividing themselves into components that men could understand. A trinity. Even in Templegate, they practice the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 
Before I start deep searching, I would just like to say that I already discussed all the implications of page two. In all of the comic books, page two is the exact same. Anyway, let's get on with the research. Our story starts off with Sullivan Noth helping a woman drink a cup of potassium cyanide. The scene is no doubt inspired by the November 18, 1978 Jonestown Massacre, where more than 900 people lost their lives from mostly forced cyanide poisoning. After the woman drinks the cyanide, Noth walks back to the chapel behind him where he presumably finds Blake with the baby in his arms. However, we don't see that. We are focused on the countless amounts of ants swarming the radio tower from atop the hill. The ants chip away at the tower until it eventually breaks and blows up. The light that emanates from the explosion is most likely the same from the end of Outlast 2, where Blake sees the sun explode. Approximately seven hours later, Pauline Glick with several other agents and a cleanup crew investigate the carnage and assumably the radio tower's destruction. One of the agents says, these local corpses show signs of cyanide poisoning. This statement confirms the drink that Noth was giving the woman earlier was laced with cyanide. As the secret Murkoff unit continues the cleanup operation, they find Lynn Langerman's deceased body. Pauline says something that's pretty interesting after the discovery. She says, she was at the hospital last week, asking questions about the escaped Templegate woman. Fucking Paul Marion. He was supposed to be making sure she and her husband Blake didn't find this place. I have a question. How did Lynn find out about Anna Lee in the first place? From the last comic book, the entire Anna Lee event was extremely small, relatively speaking. And that's not even mentioning that everything took place in the middle of nowhere. How could these two bigwig investigative journalists find out about something so microscopic? I have a theory that may explain why this occurred, but I'll save it for the theory section of this video. Coming from page 7 and entering page 9, Pauline tells one of the other agents that Blake needs to go to a black site. For those who don't know, black site is a location at which an unacknowledged black operation or black project is conducted. An example that everyone should be familiar with is Guantanamo Bay. Before the CIA officially recognized the facility, Guantanamo Bay was a black site. However, some people still consider it to be one. Further down the page, Pauline makes her thoughts clear about Paul Marion. She says, do me a favor and find his corpse, because if he's still alive, he's fucking dangerous. She's basically saying, find Paul and kill him. I wonder if she will have a change of heart after she realizes Paul was kidnapped instead of conspiring against Murkoff. However, considering the two perspectives are being told from the future and that this is the last comic book, I can't really pinpoint or make an educated guess on how the two of them ended up as enemies. Clearly, if Paul told Pauline he was kidnapped and didn't divulge any top secret information to Simon, there would be no need for killing him. I guess what I'm trying to say is, what motivated Paul to go to the FBI facility in the first place? And why was Pauline at the infirmary? We are missing an event that took place between the two and I have no information that would lead me to guess what transpired. It's a mystery that I hope is explained in the next batch of comic books. The last three pages are pretty self-explanatory. However, there are two theories I was able to come up with from reading the dialogue between Paul and Simon. Now it's time for the theory section of the video. While reading this issue, I came to a small epiphany at the end of page 7. On the fifth panel of said page, Pauline says, Fucking Paul Marion, he was supposed to be making sure she and her husband Blake didn't find this place. Obviously, we can assume the reason why Paul slacked off his responsibility was because he was kidnapped by Simon Peacock, which could have made it easier for Lynn and Blake to discover the murder cover-up. It seems pretty open and shut. However, considering Lynn and Blake discovered the Anna Lee incident with no such ease, even though the event took place in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, who's to say Paul didn't tip the duo off? Just like how Wayland Park tipped off Miles Upshur. No evidence exists, however, it wouldn't have been unrealistic for his character to do. Judging from past comics, Paul isn't enamored with the fact that he silences people to cover up loose ends. Let's also take into consideration that Paul Marion is technically a whistleblower. He's at the FBI on-site hospital divulging top secret information to a government agent. Even though we're lacking information between his kidnapping and present events, it shows that his conscience is still dominant. Knowing that he was one of the reasons why a pregnant woman was murdered might have consumed him with guilt, and this would have led him to secretly tip off the investigative journalists. If this is the truth, then Paul Marion was the catalyst that thrusted Outlast 2 into a bona fide reality. On page 10 of the comic, Simon Peacock says this, I don't know much except that what Murkoff made of me was a rough draft. I can only assume he's talking about how he was a prototype of some sort to the fully realized wall writer. However, there's one thing that confuses me. As we know from issue 4, Simon used to work for Murkoff until he leaked confidential information to the public. Why would a Murkoff employee be experimented on? You could say after leaking the information, Simon was kidnapped, just like Waylon. But that's not possible because on page 11 of issue 4, Paul makes it clear that after leaking the information, Simon vanished entirely. He would have had to have been experimented on prior to the leaks. Maybe Simon actually volunteered to participate in Project Wallrider, and after becoming horribly disfigured, he decided to leak the confidential information. But that's almost incomprehensible. 
Simon must have witnessed what the experimentation does to people, so it doesn't make sense that he would volunteer for something so dangerous. And that's not even mentioning that inmates were being experimented on, so there would be no need to work on a staff member. No matter how much I think about it, I can't make sense of how Simon would have participated in the project. Maybe when future comics come out, more information will be released on what his past life at Murkoff looked like. Considering the monologue that happened at the end of the comic book, I can only assume Spindletop Psychotherapy Clinic was used for wall rider experimentation. I come to this conclusion because the treatment that was happening at the clinic was one of religion and hypnosis on PTSD soldiers, which sounds strikingly similar to the Templegate incident, minus the soldiers. What if before Templegate, Murkoff used Spindletop to further the progress on Project Wall Rider? It just seems too perfect not to be the case. Luckily, I even have some evidence for my claim. It's revealed that Jeremy Blair actually purchased a psychotherapy clinic. Let me say that again in different words. The head of the Mount Massive facility purchased a psychotherapy clinic that helps PTSD-ridden soldiers by utilizing religion and hypnosis. If that's not enough for you, Chris Walker is literally a byproduct of the experimentation at Spindletop. Everything just seems to fit into place.